Namaste everyone, my name is Mamta and today we have gathered for a discussion and lecture. The subject would be from the evolution of yoga to the tradition of lineage of Kevaladham, we are going to do a manthan over it, the churning. We have our very own Sri Sudhir Tiwariji here to lead the discussion, to share his thoughts on the subject. Sudhir Tiwariji was born in Allahabad, Prayag in India. His name was chosen by very own Swami Kuvalyanandji. He received his first training under the guidance of Swami Digambarji, a disciple of Swami Kuvalyanandji, and his father, Sri Om Prakash Tiwariji. Sudhirji received his primary and advanced yogic and Ayurvedic training from Swami Digambarji, which included the study of traditional texts, mantra yoga, fire ceremony, pranayam, and various aspects of Adhyatma yoga. Sudhirji also learned pranayam and hat pradipika from his father. He travels all around the world conducting workshops in theory and practice of yoga that includes asana, pranayam, meditation, chanting, and Ayurveda. With his familiarity of alternative Western medicine, he also correlates these disciplines. Sudhirji's goal is to present yoga not just as an asana, but as an experiential practice encompassing but not limiting to yama, niyam, asana, pranayam and meditational techniques. Mantra yoga and techniques of Ishwa Pranidhan of Patanjali not to be forgotten. We all invite Sri Sudhir Tiwariji. I'm so happy to be here. It's uh, more like a homecoming for me huh, than anything else. Uh, because I mentioned, as I mentioned before, um, I grew up in Kevaladha, so I was born in 1964. So from 1964 to 1989, um, I've spent my years in Kevaladha. And I know uh, the topic of our discussion is from the evolution of yoga to the lineage uh, and tradition of Kevaladha. Things in India are slightly different than the rest of the world and yoga is uh, really needed and it's been branching off into schools and other faculties. So the need for yoga teachers has also increased, which is a good thing. And I, I mean, there's nothing wrong um, to seek a job through yoga, nothing wrong with it. As long as we also, with seeking the job, try to understand the true meaning of yoga and more importantly, also practice yoga. So thank you for your feedback. Now my second question is, when you applied for the course, whether it is a nine month course, whether it's a two year uh, master's course or a three year bachelor's course, um, what brought you to Kevaladham? What did you see uh, in your research? I'm not talking about the top five yoga schools as in YouTube. Uh, you, YouTube has top five yoga schools listed and Kevaladham is one of them. I'm not asking about that. But did you look into it? Why did you want to come to Kevaladham? For the food, uh, for the Lunavla Hill Station? What brought you here? Anyone, please. Don't be shy. No one? How will you teach? Teaching methods is a course. Huh? At least one person. Okay, there. To be honest, it is the nearest place from my home. So I just... <laughs> the home is within you. You want to stay by with yourself, huh? <laughs> so the reason I asked you what brought you to Kevaladham is because sometimes it's not just yoga, no matter what discipline you choose, whether you choose engineering, whether you choose arts, whether you choose commerce, and if we have a choice to get into the school that we want, we do some research on it. 
we look at why is this school important and why do I need to go into this school? And I never asked myself this question until maybe 14 years ago, although I was brought up here and I, I've been so lucky to be in the company of some great uh, personalities, starting with Swami Digambarji, of course, my father, and some great faculty of Kevaladham as growing up, Dr. Gharote, Dr. Bhole, Dr. Ganguly, Dr. Sahu. Uh, maybe you might have seen the names on some books or some publications of Kevaladham. But for me, uh, they were family. And uh, I was very inspired by them. And But this, uh, you know, the importance of Kevaladham uh, did not occur to me. You don't realize how important your home is until you leave your home. And that's exactly the case with me. Yeah? And the reason it is pertinent, uh, my story, is because for me and hopefully for you, it will put things into perspective in terms of evolution of yoga and the tradition lineage of Kevladham. For me, I was born and brought up here and I had no intention of becoming a yoga teacher, being associated with teaching yoga or working in a yoga institute. Um, I had enough people doing that, my father and then eventually my brother. And then my main goal was I did my engineering from Bangalore. And in 89, I went off to the US and did my MBA. And my dream was to work in a corporate world. So from 1992 to 2011, I worked in a corporate world and um, at the sea level, um, also at the national level. Um, I did not quit practicing. Now the practices that were prescribed to me by Swami Digambarji are still the practices that I do today. So I never quit practicing asanas, pranayam, so on and so forth. Uh, and occasionally, I also taught. So my first workshop that I taught was in, in India was in 1983. I was 19 years old, and I had graduated from, uh, I had just gotten a certificate. I taught the railway department in Pune for a span of one month. I used to go up and down and teach. And I kept that teaching on once a year, I would either go to France or in, in the U.S. or I would teach yoga the way it was taught in Kevalanha. In 2011, I quit my job and for some reason I came back um, into teaching. And just like my father, I started traveling all around the world. All that I knew at that time was traditional yoga, the way it is taught in India and the way it has always been taught in India. But when I went from studios to studio, whether it's in the US, whether it's in Canada or in Europe or in Japan or in China, what I saw did not closely have any resemblance to yoga the way we practice it. It was totally a very distorted form of yoga. And since I had just started, I was slightly aggressive. I was uh, confrontational. I said, what you're doing is not yoga. And everyone said, no, no, this is tradition. This is where I've learned from. So what I decided was that before I talk too much, let me do my own homework. And in that homework, let me try to find out how yoga has evolved in time. And in this evolution of yoga, what is tradition? What is lineage? What are styles? What are fads? And what is the contribution of Kevaladham in all of this? And after I 
completed this study, this project of my own. It was just for my own sake. And that's when I started to appreciate Kevaladham more and more and the lineage more and more. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time when talking about the evolution of yoga. All of you are really very capable students as I see it. You guys practice silence very well. Uh, that's very needed in the yoga world. That was a joke. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so you must know the first name associated with yoga. What is the first name associated with yoga? Anyone? And do you know this verse that talks about it? And where is it taken from? Hiranyagarbha yogasya vakta nanyaha puratanaha from Mahabharat Shanti Parva. Hiranyagarbha is the oldest, the most ancient commentator in the field of yoga, and there is no one who predates him. Now, this has been also substantiated by Swami Kuvalanandaji. I think it's either in his book Pranayam or one of the articles in Yogi Mamsa where he says that Yogi Yagyavalk has also substantiated this point that Hiran Hiranyagarbha did exist and Hiranyagarbha Sutras did exist. So establishing this fact that Hiranyagarbha is the oldest commentator on yoga, then comes the point, when did yoga begin? What is the first evidence that the yoga existed at a certain point? Now, to be really honest, when we talk about this time business, uh, it lacks accuracy. You cannot say that this, you pinpoint that. But there are two ways you want to look at it. If you look at Hiranyagarbha being the oldest commentator, and if you look at Hiranyagarbha as a person, as mentioned by Yogi Yagivalk, then okay, you can set up a date. But if you look at Hiranyagarbha as a concept, and if you look at Hiranyagarbha from a Vedantic point of view, Hiranya. You know what it means. It means golden, radiant. And garbha means the womb or the embryo. So Hiranyagarbha is the golden, radiant embryo, golden womb. Now, in our system of thought, we believe that the entire universe is born out of Hiranyagarbha. Now, if you told that line, then you say yoga has existed since the beginning of time. You cannot put a date to it. Hmm? But for convenience, let us put a date on it. And you draw a timeline. Hmm? I normally have a presentation that I, when I talk about this, but since it's a conversation, I did not want to waste time just showing the presentation and showing pictures. So let's imagine. There's a point A, which is the beginning of yoga, and there's a point B in the straight line, which is right now. So yoga originated at point A, and that line shows the evolution of yoga. And if you look at the point B, then you will see tradition, lineage, styles, and fads featuring prominently. How did this single line of yoga evolve in so many people? Now, in order to understand that, we have to ascertain, first of all, that in that timeline, no matter where you put your finger, yoga has existed. So from this point of view, a lot of scholars, and again, when we talk about the evolution of yoga, different people have approached this topic in so many different ways. Some have said, okay, we found evidence of yoga in Upanishads. We found your open, evidence of yoga in Puranas, Hatha Yogic texts. So that's one way to approach the evolution of yoga. The other way to approach the evolution of yoga is through the timeline. 
So we know that yoga has evolved in time from point A to point B. Now, how is that timeline divided? So, in general, you see 15,000 years or before did yoga exist? And if it did, what was the evidence? Did yoga exist between 15,000 BC and 5,000 BC? And if it did, what is the evidence? Did yoga exist 5,000 BC to 250 AD? If it did, what is the evidence? And did yoga exist 250 AD until now? If it did, what is the evidence? And what transformation has happened in yoga? Now, based on this, we can divide yoga into four periods. 15,000 years and before generally is called the Vedic period. From 15,000 to 5,000 is called the pre-classical period. From 5,000 to 250, it's called the classical period. And from 250 until now, it's called the post-classical period. And within the post-classical period, there are many branching offs that have taken place. So let us look at the Vedic period and what is the evidence? So we know that Indus Valley civilization or Sindhu uh, civilization, is a testament to the Vedic period. And if we look at the artifacts, carvings of that period from Mohanjodaro, you will find seals, statuettes, artifacts depicting meditative postures, yoga postures, asanas. And in one case, they were able they were able to extract a skeleton of a person in a meditative pose. Huh? So we know that yoga existed at that time. And again, I'm, this is a topic that can go on and on, but I'll try to summarize it. Then we have the pre-classical period. How do we know yoga existed in pre-classical period? Then we look at our texts. We look at our scriptures, Upanishad. Puranas that were written in that period, that were compiled in that period. And these texts also have evidence that yoga existed by means of yogic practices. Some texts will talk about dhyana, some talk, talk, texts will talk about dharana. Bhagavad Gita talks about everything, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, everything. And then some texts will talk about rag, dvesh, all these terminologies come here. Practices are mentioned there. Mentions of asanas is there. In, say, um, Yoga Tattva Upanishad, there's also Yoga Bindu Upanishad. So we know that yoga did exist at that time. Then we come to classical period. And now classical period has its theme for a reason. And the reason is, I would have normally asked you the question, but we'll be, you know, kind of taking time, um, consuming time. So the reason it is called the classical period, because it is believed that Patanjali, Maharishi Bhagwan Patanjali was born around that time. That's the reason it's called classical period. Everyone okay with me? Huh? Are you getting what I'm saying? Am I clear enough? Yeah? I can hear you. Yes. So the reason it's called classical because of Patanjali. And why is it called, why is it called classical because of Patanjali? What did Patanjali do? So he did two things. The first answer you get from the first sutra. What is the first sutra of chapter one? What does it mean? Hmm? Anyone? MS students? Ah. Oh, very good. Now the instructions are. Then what was he doing before? See, when you talk about sutra, 
जैसे अल्पाक्षरम संदिग्धम सारवत विश्व तो मुखम अस्तु भमन वद्यंच सूत्रम सूत्र विदो विदु इट हैज टू रिलीव डाउट्स नॉट क्रिएट डाउट्स नाउ इफ से नाउ the instruction on yoga then you have a question what was he doing before so again there are many interpretations of this sutra and i'm not saying that is incorrect that is also correct in its own place but as a yoga student you have to dig in deeper atha means atha now now anushasan is the word that may have different meanings it can mean discipline it can mean instructions it can mean path but if you break the word down it is anu sashana anu means to follow sashana means organized structure now the organized structure of yoga which means previously it was not organized and if you go previously as i said in the pre classical period you had mention of yoga but the practices were scattered so what did patanjali do he brought everything under one roof and that's what we call ashtanga yoga patanjali he gave it a logically organized structure that is his first contribution the second contribution of patanjali is especially when it comes to practices and perhaps he knew that in the future people will be bickering and fighting about yoga i am right and you are right and this is wrong and this is right so when it comes to asanas and pranayam he gave us a protocol and the protocol is he gave us a definition sthir sukham asanam he gave us a technique prayatna shaitilya ananta samapati dhyan and then he gave us an outcome tato dwandvana bighatah no no matter what way you want to interpret it there's not many ways you can interpret it but this is the protocol of asana similarly he did with pranayam tasmin sati swasha prashwasa yor gati vichheda pranayam bahaya dhyantara stam then outcome tatakshyate prakash avaranam dharana sucha yogatah manasa this is the outcome now this protocol became the foundation of tradition as we know it it does not mean that tradition did not exist prior to patanjali it did exist all that was done was done in tradition but patanjali gave it a protocol he gave it a structure now that is the importance of the classical period now in the post classical period then you can see the advent and the name of the word hatha yoga being mentioned quite a bit ah hatha yoga and hatha yogic texts also when it comes to asanas and pranayam did not shy away from the protocol of patanjali some people say oh you know hatha yogic texts are different patanjali is different i beg to disagree patanjali's protocol was followed if, for example kriya some say oh there are no kriyas in patanjali yoga what so he talks about shauch shauch is nothing but cleansing the kriyas are cleansing the protocol of asanas atyahara prayashascha not too much exertion sthir sukham asanam so there's not much difference however post classical you had yogic texts written and if you look authoritative and authentic yogic texts that were written every 200 to 300 years you start with vashishta samhita then you start with goraksha samhita gorakshatak siddha siddhant paddhati hatha pradipika ghiran samhita shiva samhita and latest 18th century was um, ashtang yoga uh, charandas from bhakti sagar now you ask yourself a question why were these texts written every 200 300 years what was the need now you go back to the history what happened india or bharat as now i may call it was constantly under invasion from outside forces people's lives changed stress levels changed 
and they had to adapt to the changing times. And hence, in my point of view, in my mind, the way I look at it, perhaps the practices also had to, you know, adapt to the changing times without compromising the principles of the practice. So if you see, Hatapra Deepika has how many asanas? Anyone? 15. Giran Samhita? 32. Why? How many kriyas all together in Hatapra Deepika? Shat kriyas, but uh, including the sub sections, sub kriyas. Giran Samhita has 23. Hatapra Deepika has 8 or 9. Why? So perhaps one reason was to adapt to changing times. There was another reason for that. See, we human beings, you know, communication is a good thing, but communication is inherently flawed. Why? Because when message passes on from one person to the other person, we, when I was doing my MBA, we did an exercise in communication. There were 10 people, we were 10 people were made to stand. And I had to say something to person one. And then that person had to say something to something else. The next person then C and D and until we reached the 10th person. And then you compare the message. So for example, if I tell a person A, that next morning we have to meet in the office, you wear black pants, white shirt, a tie, and then we go for lunch and half day will be off. By the time this message reached to the 10th person, the message was, we will meet in the office, you will only wear pants and ties, no shirt, and the whole day off. So communication sometimes is good, but it also has an inherent flaw. So every teacher adds a flavor to the practice that they, the way they teach. Nothing wrong, it's natural. But when the dilution becomes so much that the practice is nowhere to be found in its original form. And at the same time, the principles of yoga are compromised. And perhaps every 200, 300 years, these texts were written to make a correction. Hmm. As Swatma so Ram says, Bhrantya Bhumatvante Raja Yogam Najanatam Hatap Pradipika Dhatte Swatma Rama Kripakara. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of dilution, there's a lot of misinterpretation of these texts. Hence, by the grace of my Guru, I am writing Hatap Pradipika. And hence, there were so many texts that were written. Everyone okay? So everyone understands what tradition is? Hmm? Yes? Now let's look at lineage. So as I said, subsequent to classical period, there were texts that were written. Now in the 18th or 19th century, for example, there is a school who may want to make a curriculum or a gurukulam or a teacher. And they would say, I would source my practices from Hatapradipika only. I want all these texts, Hatyogic texts, mind you, they were authentic and authoritative following the tradition. So they say, I would source my practice from this text and you make a curriculum. That becomes the lineage of that school. Then say, for example, school B comes and says, you know what? Our practices will be sourced from Hatha Pradipika and Geran Samhita. That will be our curriculum. That is what we will teach. That becomes the lineage of school B. So this keeps going on. Now, what happened in the 18th century in the post-classical period is yoga overtly left India and went outside of India, especially West maybe towards the East, especially U.S. and Europe. 1897 with Swami Vivekananda and later on Paramahansa Yogananda. Now in this period too, whether it was away from India or within India, and this period, by the way, is a sub-period called modern period in yoga when Vivekananda went out. 
But yoga was still subject to dilution. Outside of India, asanas started to be called stretching exercises and the principles of isometric exercises were applied to asanas. Pranayam started to be called deep breathing and the principles of deep breathing were applied to pranayam. So there was dilution overseas. But mind you, even within India, there was dilution. Especially in lineages of the south. I'm not going to name the names, but gymnastics was utilized in doing yoga. Physiotherapy, alignment therapy came into yoga. Isometric exercises came into yoga. That dilution was also happening. Vashishtasan, Hanumanasan, they are only very recent. They are sourced from isometric exercises. So when you look at all this, the dilution was happening and someone had to make a correction. And that's where Swami Kuvalanandaji becomes very relevant. By the advice of his teacher, Swami Madhav Dasji Maharaj, Swami Kuvalanandaji, he was into physical education and he, Swami Kuvalanandaji was also a science scholar. But he was made to study science by his teacher just because his teacher, Swami Madhav Dasji Maharaj, wanted him to do scientific research in yoga so that results of yogic practices as espoused in Swami Kvalanandaji opened this institute in 1924. It was registered in 1917, but the brick and mortar business uh, buildings were opened in 1924. Hmm? So please keep in mind, the purpose was the same. If the text says this is the definition of asana, this is how to do it, and this is the outcome. Now, can the outcome be validated based on the technique and the definition? Same applies to pranamic practices. And hence, the scientific research department was open. Now, keep in mind, now we talk about Kevaladham lineage. So, just as I said, lineages were practices sourced from different texts. How many of you have read the book Pranayam by Swami Kuvalanandaji? Keep in mind, Hatha Pradipika is not the lineage of Kevaladha. Gheran Samhita is not the lineage of Kevaladha. Shiva Samhita is not the lineage of Kevaladha. Swami Kuvalanandaji spent many amount of hours studying these texts. And the essence of these texts can be, was presented in three texts that are Kevaladham publications. Asana by Swami Kuvalanandaji, Pranayam by Swami Kuvalanandaji, Yogic Therapy by Swami Kuvalanandaji and Dr. S. L. Vinekar. These three texts to me define the lineage of Kevaladham. And the practices should be done based on these texts. Why? Because if you look at the reference portion of these texts, Swamiji has referred to more than 10 traditional texts while writing these books, and he validated the findings subsequently in Yoga Mamsa publications also. Ah. Now keep in mind, Swamiji also knew that scientific research is incomplete without philosophical research. Why? Because if I have to do Kapalabhati and if I have to do research on Kapalabhati, the questions come, what is the correct technique? You don't invent a technique. There has to be a reference. If I am doing Surabhedan, I just don't invent the technique of Surabhedan. I just don't invent the technique of Vastrika Pranayam. I need to find an authentic source which is based on texts. And for that reason, PLRD, Philosophical Literary Research Department, open. 
We have some, you know, Dr. Bodhe is here. He was closely associated with that department. There, we had scholars there doing immense amount of research. And Swamiji, he was uh, something else. He, when Hatapradipika was being, the manuscripts were being checked, what Swamiji saw was all the Hatapradipika that's available out there have four chapters. And he said, no, it's incomplete because once the book is complete, the author just mentioned this is atasamapti or itisamapti, whatever they want to say. The four chapters did not have it. He found manuscript with five chapters which had the same verse, now completes the text. So he was himself into it, even Gorak Shatak. The versions of Gorak Shatak were available where you have Shatak means 100. It's supposed to have 100 verses. But then you had some with 400, some with 300. From those verses, Swamiji chose 100. He thought, okay, this is what I think 100 would be. Eventually, he was able to find a manuscript out of London. And his 100 matched the exact 100 that London manuscript had. Uh, so that was his dedication. And based on this premise, he started his research because now, for example, most of the research on Kapal Bhati and Bhastrika in the whole world has been done in by based on Kundalini Yoga, the group Kundalini Yoga. Now, their Kapal Bhati sometimes is done with an open mouth and moving of your hands. Now, that's not Kapal Bhati. If you read Swamiji's book Pranayam, he gives he spent a lot of time on that chapter. What's round? What is a stroke? How does a round begin? How does a round end? What should be the speed? What should be the pace? So if anyone tells you Hatta Pradipika is the tradition of Keraldham, lineage of Keraldham, you should beg to disagree. Because the lineage of Keraldham are these three texts and fortunately they have been researched. It you know, I, I'll share something with you. The book Pranayam and Asana, I make a point of reading it now at least once in every two months. It's hundreds of time I've read it. The first time I read Pranayam, I did not understand it. I did not quit. I said, he's written it for a reason. I read it again, I read it again, I read it again. And once I was able to understand it, then we started a three-year Pranayam course in Kevaladham itself, because those books are complete within themselves. So this is the lineage of Kevaladham. Now, when it comes to Swami Kuvalananda Ji, you should understand he was not brand conscious. He did not want popularity. Not many of you must know that Mahatma Gandhi was his student. Now famous Krishnamacharya ji used to come to Kevaladham. He came to Kevaladham. He brought his five students on the advice of the royalty of Mysore. The royalty of Mysore sent Sri Krishnamacharya ji Swami Kovalananda ji. Because Sri Krishnamacharya had to open a shala and the Mysore uh, royalty said, before you open a shala, we'll only give you approval when Swami ji okays it. So he came to Kevaladham with five of his students demonstrated in front of Swamiji. Then the emperor of the royalty wanted Swamiji's feedback. Swamiji sent his feedback to the royalty saying that I have advised Shastri. You know, um, uh, Krishnamacharya ji was known as Shastri ji. So I have advised Shastri ji to make his yogic poses less dynamic and take the exercise element out of it. So he was a mentor to Sri Krishnamacharya. He was a mentor to Ayangarji. Prior to the uh, 60s, Ayangarji used to come to Kevaladham all the time. Ah, and uh, B.R. Ambedkar, if you have heard, he uh, was treated by Swamiji. Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhiji. If you read the, uh, his uh, biography, you'll find a lot of substantial information there. So Swamiji was well revered. He was offered positions in the U.S. He refused it. So that's the kind of person he is. So for me, I feel proud to be associated with Kevaladham because when I go out, whenever there's a dispute or a contradiction, 
I know that I have something to fall back to. I have the texts, I have the books, I have the philosophical reasoning, and I have the scientific proof. What else do you want? Hmm? So having said this, I will now conclude. Thank you very much patiently for listening to me. Hmm? And I hope you read these books.